This is part two of the true history of Avgas. Uh, like I said, this is a deep dive into Avgas, and that means we must look at the programs that have been created to achieve an unleaded alternative and what has happened so far. So stick with me on Flywire. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to keep this. Uh, we're going to keep swimming in the Avgas pool. It's real sticky in here, but we absolutely have to know how we got here to make a good choice as to where we're going, what the path is uh, in the future to get to that unleaded uh, Avgas fuel. Today is about history with a little technical stuff thrown in. I see the issue through a pretty harsh light, frankly. 2030 is just around the corner, and the way things move, it's, it's, everything moves slow. Our progress is questionable for the last 11 years of governmental involvement, so I'm, uh, I'm pretty concerned at this point. What I'm going to talk about is mostly the state of PAFI, the Piston Aviation Fuel Initiative, and EGLE, the Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions Initiative. Both of those are uh, FAA programs uh, funded by Congress to uh, come up with an alternative. There are a couple of things we need to get on the table before we start, okay? I think we just have to understand that. First is, what the heck is ASTM anyway? It's an independent agency known as the ASTM International, formerly known as the American Society for Testing and Materials, okay? Now their job is to put, uh, to develop testing guides and standard specifications for various industries and products all over the board. Uh, in this process, you're gonna hear a lot about ASTM and, uh, okay, so there it is. I'm sure you've heard of the UL Lab safety testing of various products. They used to be known as the Underwriters Laboratories and they are the gold standard for product safety rating. If you see the UL, you know it's, it'll work or it should. Uh, they do product safety tests and the like. Essentially, ASTM is similar to UL, except they only develop the testing guides or the product specifications. They rely on industry to actually do the testing and provide the data. So everybody in industry gets involved in it. Uh, so that is important to know uh, and understand. An ASTM specification is no guarantee of ownership, especially outside of the U.S. Okay, if you spend a lot of money, effort, and time developing an alternative fuel, the, that d detail is rather important, okay? I'm, I mean, what can you say? I'm not doing it for free. Second, I hear a lot of folks talking about the aromatics and saying things like some fuels have them and some do not. An aromatic is an organic compound that essentially shares electrons in a ring, okay? And the ring formation structure of the molecule, okay? They're very volatile, and another term is reactive. They make very good solvents and are quite good at increasing the octane number of gasoline. And when burning, the reaction is not a runaway, uh, runaway process, and that's a good thing, okay? So, in fact, 100 low lead by the ASTM specification can contain significant quantities of various aromatics like toluene isopentane, and xylene, as much as 30 to 50% by volume. So the short answer is, to the glaring question, is that all aviation gasolines have varying degrees of aromatics in them, okay? And they still meet the ASTM specification. The actual makeup of any volume of Avgas can vary quite a bit, depending on where it is uh, refined, what the base stock of the crude oil is, and the octane package that was mixed into it, okay? Not all batches of Avgas are created equal either, so it all depends, <laughs> unfortunately. So tetraethyl lead content uh, for 100 low lead is 2.2 uh, grams per gallon, 100 130 is 4.3 grams per gallon, and 115.45 is 4.9 grams per, per gallon. FYI, 115.45 added a bit more in the way of aromatics and aniline, which is used in clothing dyes, medicine, and early rocket fuel. That's for you trivia fanatics. One important note is that 100 low lead is very close to being uh, equivalent to 100, 130 fuel, even with half the, tea, uh, the tetraethyl lead. How do they do it? Well, by running it through the refining process again, reformate, I think is what that's called, and adding aromatics, toluene to be specific. Then Congress funded the PAFI program to find an alternative to tetraethyl lead to boost octane ratings. And that program rep recognized two separate paths to achieving unleaded aviation gasoline. The fleet-wide authorization is through the ASTM process, 
and then there's via the normal uh, FAA STC, Supplemental Type Certificate Process. PAFI Phase 1 testing began in March of 2015 to downselect from 16 offers and 17 submittals to three offers and four formulations. The PAFI Tech Committee did just that in uh, September of that year. GAMI elected not to participate in the PAFI ASTM test program, pursuing the fleetwide, uh, instead pursuing the fleetwide STC solution. They did this because they tried to present to the ASTM in 2010, only to have one of the observers in the crowd try to file a patent on their presentation. Plus, the ASTM denied GAMI's desire to include a detailed hydrocarbon analysis, DHA, which is basically a molecular fingerprint for the fuel in the specification. The reason to deny the, the DHA was because it would constrain refineries in making the fuel to, to do that. They had to do it exactly according to the DHA, and the people didn't want to do that. The FAA General Counsel informed GAMI that they did not have to pursue the ASTM process, and there is an FAA rule that details the ASTM specifications that apply to normal category airplanes, but explicitly, explicitly state this is not the only means of compliance. GAMI developed a specification for G100UL that is equivalent to an ASTM specification, and the FAA accepted it as such and issued them an AML STCs. They had done reams of testing. I'm not going to go into much more detail on GAMI's G100UL in this video. Stay tuned in the next video for that, uh, or a future one. Phase one completed in January 2016. August 30, 2016, Swift Fuel gets G UL94 approved through the ASTM process for engines certified for 80, 8087, 91, and 94 octane. Essentially, UL94 is 100 low lead without the lead package. December 20th, 2016, phase two began. Somehow one of the three officer offerers dropped out. I couldn't find out the reason why. July 25th, 2017, phase two testing with Shell and Swift was running. And then July, June 4th, 2018, flight test, one third of the complete and engine tests, I think about 20% complete. September 7th, 2018, PAFI phase one and two issues with Shell and Swift. Swift dropped out to pursue another fuel via the STC path, and Shell attempts to optimize their formulation. June 20th, 2019, the developers, uh, now Phillips 66, Lyndell, uh, Lyndell uh, VP Racing, and Shell. Shell drops out then for problems with fuel, saying they're not going, they're going to go back to R&D, and we don't hear from them again. Phillips 66 drops out due to deposits and significant signs of pre-ignition. It is unknown what their status is now. Um, just have, they've gone silent. July 21, at Oshkosh, GAMI receives the STC for the first tranche of airplanes and engines to use G100UL. And in September 22, GAMI achieves STC for G100UL, covering every piston engine, air, fixed wing aircraft, and piston engine to boot. Uh, 22, Eagle launches to kick start that moribund, unleaded alternative search. Nobody but GAMI in the play. Uh, who's hearing anything from Swift Fuel? And in June 23, Flight School Operator logs 46,000 hours using Swift UL94 and experienced exhaust valve rescission. They reverted to 100 low lead and Lycoming conducted an analysis and determined that aromatic concentrations may be responsible for the problem due to aromatics contributing to slower flame speed and radiant heat and more abrasiveness from particulates. To me, this is a bit of a squishy conclusion. The octane package, be it aromatic or tetraethyl lead's job is to slow the flame speed in that controlled manner. So it can happen in a controlled manner. The lead itself is the source of particulate matter and the majority of the crap that you see on the piston and in the cylinder. And if it's not there, well, just saying, I think it needs a little bit more detail from this report. Valve rescission is a result of micro welds between the valve and the valve seat, and lead slows that reaction. Harder seats also help. November 28, 23, uh, Lyondell VP Racing News release saying they were the first unleaded fuel candidate to pass PAFI's initial detonation and 150 hour engine durability test. They all continue with phase two full scale testing on 10 engines and eight aircraft. Expect to be completed in 12 to 18 months. Nah, not done yet. April 10th, 24, Lyondell VP Racing completes a 350-hour engine durability test. September 25th, uh, 24, Swift Fuels 
obtains an STC for their 100R formulation of Avgas for the Cessna 172 RNS only. They begin shipping restricted use of the fuel. It's unclear to me whether Swift Fuels actually will pursue the ASTM path at this point, and they have said that because they've said that the STC path will be their approach to reach fleetwide acceptance, and they have the uh, forever STC for that. Swift will phase out UL94 upon completing the STC process for 100R. That's what they've said. And in fall of 24, Vital refines uh, 1 million uh, gallons of G100 UL for distribution, and it begins in California. Uh, and a, plus, a few other places. It's a, one of them here in Texas. And all of this experimental aircraft are not included. True, the engines that power quite a few experimentals use certified engines, and the G100UL STC covers those, but a significant number are not covered. There is quite a bit of controversy regarding the implementation of GAMI's G100UL, uh, clipping paint, chipping paint, swelling of seals, etc. cetera. Uh, that's what Flywire is going to look at next. That's on my list here. And then what on my list is also to get with Swift Fuels and see what the progress of their formulation is. Also, I want to check in with Lyondell VP Racing on their U100E unleaded fuel. Right now, it's my understanding that neither Swift 100R or VP Racing U100E meet the rich spec up for octane rating. That could prove a significant problem for higher power, higher compression engines in the fleet. Uh, I've got a couple of those. Uh, this one is, remember, 65 octane, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. But everything else, yeah, it's a huge problem. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.